Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring, and today I'm joined by Melissa, and she has a really interesting story. She had an injury from antidepressants that resulted in, I guess, essentially polydrugging, polypharmacy problems afterwards, where she was convinced that she was mentally ill by, I guess, outside influences, and that kind of delayed things for her. This was further complicated by a pregnancy, and she's going to talk a little bit about dealing with pregnancy while, you know, having problems with polypharmacy, and and then ultimately what what sounds like a you know a fairly decent recovery so you know Melissa I'm really excited to hear your story and so we're going to dive right in and I'm going to say just just tell us what what happened to you hey well thanks so much I really appreciate you taking the time with me today so my story began in 2011 um I was experiencing depressive symptoms that I had never experienced before and at the time, what had happened was I had been working a job that I absolutely loved and I was laid off. So I think naturally I went into a bit of a depressive state, but it lasted for about a month. And at that time, I just was kind of concerned with my symptoms. They weren't severe, but they were limiting me to some degree. So uh, being a diabetic for many years, I was very involved in the medical community. I trusted my doctor. So I went and discussed my symptoms with him and right away got slapped with a depressive disorder um, diagnosis. And so I was given an antidepressant, an SSRI. And I remember distinctly being told, this isn't like some of the other drugs. These ones are not addictive. They are easy to come off. You know, I'm not giving you a benzo type of thing. And so I started taking them. And truthfully, I did feel relief of the symptoms I was having quite quickly. I don't remember having negative startup effects at all. Um, I just felt better. I just was able to kind of get out of bed and I had more motivation. I felt generally happier and more energetic. So I thought it was great. And I continued to take the drugs for seven years. The first three years, I would say, is when I felt the best. Which then, which medication were you taking? Citalopram. Okay, yep. So I started right off on a 20 milligram dose. I didn't need to pump up. I stayed on that dose actually the entire seven years. And there was mm -hmm. not much of a medication review in those whole years. I remember just seeing my doctor regularly for my diabetes and him just saying, hey, how's the mood kind of thing. And I did feel okay. So I told him that and there was never any discussion of coming off. And then in 2018, I was in a real bad financial crisis. And so it was to the point where if it's not life or death, I don't want to pay for it. I can't afford it. It was just, it was that bad. So I was just thinking, you know, I've been on these antidepressants for so long. I want to come off. It's just an extra expense. I don't really think it's doing as much as it did at the beginning. So I had a different doctor at that time because I had moved cities. And so he had discussed tapering. He said, you know, you can't stop them quickly, but cut it in half for two weeks and then cut it in half again for two weeks and then stop. So that's exactly what I did. And I started feeling symptoms pretty soon after that, but never attributed it at all to stopping antidepressants. I just didn't know. I didn't even know there was a discontinuation syndrome. I had never re read any leaflet or anything when I got the drug or through the entire time. So And, and I had the doctor, I guess, was just like, it's mild, it's self-limited. It'll last a couple of weeks. You'll be all good. Is that kind of the general gist or, or maybe you just didn't say anything? I don't know. I didn't initially, and but it was physical and mental. I had both and quite a few, like quite a laundry list of both symptoms, but I just attributed it to stress, relationship stress, work stress. Um, and it was about two months later that I started, I told my doctor and he said, oh, you're just anxious. And he offered me a benzo at that time, but I didn't take it because I had known more about the dangers of benzos so i refused the benzo and i just thought i'll just deal with it if it's he didn't say it's from withdrawing or it's from coming off he just i just remember him saying it's anxiety so i suffered through these symptoms for about six months um, and then at the five month mark actually i was quite i was quite suffering quite a bit so i decided to call a crisis helpline and they had said you know based on what you're telling us we think you should see a psychiatrist and so here in Canada it was a two-month wait to see a psychiatrist and actually in those two months I started like a lot of my symptoms just spontaneously lifted but I decided to go to the appointment anyway and when she did my intake she said base base the questions on how you had been feeling for the previous five six months rather than you know now that you're feeling better so I did that and I walked away with an OCD depression and anxiety diagnosis. And I was given citalopram again. 
20 God. milligrams yeah. and an antipsychotic to bolster, I guess, the antidepressant. Even though you're feeling better. Even though I was feeling better. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, it really clicked with her because she was a diabetic like me and she was young and I just, okay. So I started taking the antidepressant again, even though I didn't even need it. Um, and I had a, a bad reaction almost immediately. And, and may I ask before we go on, that period after you stopped the citalopram and before it started to get better, what were the what were the symptoms like that you were that you now suspect were withdrawal symptoms from the citalopram? Intrusive thoughts. I started getting right away. So like okay. flashes, flashes, visions, um, just these repeating thoughts that were bad and freaking me out. But I had had some mild OCD as a child and a teenager. And so I was like, oh, these will go away. And they didn't. I had a mix back and forth between insomnia and fatigue, really bad headaches, uh, nausea, feelings of depression and panic, like just panicky symptoms, uh, some DPDR, like some depersonalization, dizziness, uh, brain zaps. I had those. And I still didn't clue in that it was from stopping, even though brain zaps I know are pretty common. So that was the main, those were the main ones. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. You got back on the Cymbalta and the, oh, sorry, the Cymbalta and Zyprexa. What, what happened next? Um, so then I took them for about a week. I, I didn't fill the prescription for the antipsychotic. I okay. just took the citalopram. So I took them for about a week and I was having, you know, real bad rushes through my body, heart palpitations, really bad insomnia, really bad panic. My depersonalization was getting worse, you know, just agitation. So after about a week, um, I stopped taking them. I, I phoned the psychiatrist and she said, cut the dose in half. I did that. It didn't really help. So I just stopped again after a week. And then I started kind of going back to that baseline, feeling better again. But then mm -hmm. about five months later, my symptoms just came back. I don't know why. I don't know why they kind of lifted and then they came back because I wasn't taking anything when they came back. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, okay. So you're feeling a little bit better than wham, five months later, things get worse. What, what, just describe it to me. What 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 were you hit with when things reemerged? I remember it was Easter weekend and I had come home to visit family because I wasn't living where they were. And I just remember the intrusive thoughts started coming back and the anxiety and just feeling kind of just that feeling of lack of emotion, lack of feeling, just I just felt sad, down, just all of the mental symptoms mostly had returned, along with some panic. So kind of the fatigue and the insomnia and stuff and the headaches and the brain zaps they continue to stay away but it was a lot of the emotional and mental stuff that was coming back so okay. at this point I had read stuff online about withdrawal syndrome and I'm like I think this is what has been happening to me the whole time so I just was like I'm gonna push through so I pushed through for another 18 months and I wasn't really improving a lot mentally so that was at the point where I I was like I think you know, I let, I was talking to a bunch of people and reading a bunch of stuff and I had convinced myself I must just be mentally ill, even though I didn't have a history of any type of severe mental illness, but just the, the mental stuff was so bad for me. So at that point I decided, okay, I'm going to reach out for help. And then it just became the next three to four months, just continual doctor hopping, continual, you know, walk-in doctors, psychiatrists, general physicians i was just constantly reaching out for help and so I, was trying... I, I want to just interrupt you so before you reached out for help you were saying that it really was the emotional and the mental symptoms that lingered could you just describe you know what what you you know what you thought were the um those 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 withdrawal uh symptoms like the the, the character the nature you know what, what it felt like uh, at the time it was just a constant state of lack of peace. So I just never was able to relax. I just remember feeling so anxious and just my mind was never at rest. I couldn't just sit and watch TV or do normal things that I used to be able to do, read a book without just these constant scary thoughts and just things that I had never dealt with before. It was mostly panic and intrusive thoughts and mixed with depression. That was what I was dealing with the most. And I didn't have a history of, of that. Like I said, I was put on the drugs for like kind of a situational depression that felt nothing like what I was feeling at this point. So the intrusive thoughts, and you don't have to share what they, 
they were if you're not comfortable. But I think that's one of the most interesting things about these withdrawal symptoms because it, it also happens a lot with the benzo folks um, where they'll just, I mean, they just get stuck on certain things, whether it's, you know, my, yes. my girlfriend hates me, she's going to leave me, I'm such a terrible partner. And it's just like, or it could be something like that, or it could be something in the past, which you had forgotten for years. And, and now it's just like coming up and you're just in there and it's playing again and again and again. I, I was wondering if you could, 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 could because it's, it's kind of unusual, you know, uh, uh, that, that state, I was wondering if there was any way you could kind of flesh out a little bit more what that straight, that state of intrusive thoughts is like. Yeah. When I first got it, when I first came off the antidepressants, I was at work and I remember having a discussion with a coworker and I just started seeing these visions. It was related to harm, blood, like really um, disturbing stuff. And I just kept seeing them flashing through my mind. And so I'm trying to have this conversation. It's like, there's this mental wall and I'm, it was mostly related to that for me. And I didn't know where it was coming from. And it was arising this in pretty intense anxiety in me and it just wouldn't stop. It was like getting a song stuck in your head, but it was visual and it was always related to harm or death or just really dark stuff. And totally yeah. out of control and totally, and I would go to bed and wake up. And as soon as I'd open my eyes, it would start again. So pretty yeah. intense. Yeah. And so and it, always, I, it, it happens to have that like kind of taboo quality to it, which I think is also extremely distressing. You know, I've heard, yeah, things like that, you know, violence, harm. I've also heard things like, um, you know, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, like sexual stuff as well, which yeah. can be very distressing for some people. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's a, it's a really nasty state of mind. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing kind of like what that was like. And so um, you also mentioned, so this constant, constant state of unease could never really relax. Um, but earlier on, you mentioned that you had this like lack of emotions. Did you have your emotions back at that point or was it still somewhat like just blunted and then just anxiety? Like what, what, how we, was there any joy? Was there any sadness? I did that. Yeah. 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 It had re that had mostly recovered. It was just okay. this heightened state of, yeah. but I was able to start feeling emotions and stuff again. So that part had had gone away, like all yeah. of that blunting, yeah. And so then I I decided, you know, I'm just gonna try antidepressants again because I must be in some type of OCD state. Although my OCD from when I was a child was much different. It was just the odd intrusive thought, but this was just constant, like all day yeah. long, and. Uh, so I tried to go back on Citalopran again, and I went on a very low dose. I think I started at one milligram mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I started getting cortisol rushes. Like I would, I remember laying down to have a nap and it was like a bomb would go off in my head or I would hear almost like gunshots and it would jolt me out of, out of sleep. So, but I continued to take the drug and I continued to bump up the dose because I was like, I got to get this mind stuff out of, under control. So at one point, it was about a month into taking citalopram, I started having these episodes where I was getting very uh, woozy and I would just kind of pass out, but I would be conscious. So I would collapse and my heart rate would just be sky high. And I remember not knowing if it was from diabetes, if it was from this drug, which I didn't understand because I had taken it for so many years with no problems. So I ended up in the hospital ER a couple of times. I said, I don't know if it's from starting up this antidepressant again. And they said, well, we're not sure either, but we'll keep you in. We're going to send you. So, you know, I saw internists and um, psychiatrists and general physicians in my stay in the hospital. And nobody could tell me what was wrong. But when I had talked about the mental symptoms right away, you know, I got referred to psychiatry and was told, well, you're on the wrong antidepressant. So then the poly drugging started. So I come out of the hospital. I have follow-ups. I'm not happy with this psychiatrist. I see another one. I'm in and out of the walk-in doctor and with every drug I take, I'm getting more and more and more symptoms. The tinnitus starts up, you know, um, the dark, dark thoughts, uh, really bad depersonalization, really bad drowsiness, but like an over alert feeling. And so I tried like Prozac and Zoloft and Luvox and I'm just getting worse and worse and worse with every drug. And so then I, one night I remember laying in bed and I started getting this restlessness in my legs and I knew that wasn't good. And it was more than just regular run of the mill restless legs. 
and it was kind of slowly moving up my body and I was completely lost the ability to sleep. Um, I think I went five nights without sleep. Do you remember what you were on at that time when you developed, uh, I guess, what sounds like akathisia? I had went back to Citalopram. So it was like Citalopram, Prozac, Zoloft, back to Citalopram because they had decided, well, you were on this for years and doing fine. So we're going to put you back on that. And then they gave me Ativan because of the lack of sleep and the restless feelings I was developing. And so so then an Ativan took away like everything for me. So then started my benzo journey. And I was on benzos for about three weeks, loved them. They took away the mental, they took away the physical. But after about a, a month, it's like it went backwards. It like It's like it started doing the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so then yeah. my muscles started involuntarily moving. So the restlessness came back. Then my, my body started kind of flailing. And the thoughts were speeding up and coming back. And, full f- and then I started to feel what my psychiatrist then... I saw another one called somatic hallucination. So I was having intrusive thoughts along with sensations um, and then muscle severe, like muscle jerking, pulling. um, So then I didn't know what to do because I'm stuck on Ativan. So then I ended up in the ER again because my involuntary movements are getting so bad. And then I get thrown in the psych ward and then I'm trialed on other drugs and I'm put on beta blockers because at this point they said you have either TD or you have akathisia. Um, so then, then I get sent to another city to try TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation for my OCD and depression. I feel like that makes things worse. And then I'm tried on antipsychotics. And so I, I think I tried eight different drugs. And then they decided to put me on propranolol for the movements. And so I leave TMS and I come back and like I said, I had tried about eight drugs at this point and I'm just the worst I've ever been. I'm completely housebound um, and just so jacked up, like not sleeping, just intense, intense rushes through my body, feelings of pulsating electricity, involuntary movements, hallucinations, intrusive thoughts times a thousand, like just just constant, constant. And I'm starting to feel burning in my body, burning brain, weird movements in my brain, tinnitus, just constant. And so I decide to come off everything but the propranolol. And at this point, I had found a new general physician and he actually met me in the walk-in clinic and he was just horrified at the sight of me. And so he said, I'm going to send you to a neurologist. We need to get you figured out basically I want to help you so this nice walk-in doctor takes me on as a patient sends me to a neurologist who says who diagnoses me with benzo withdrawal because when I was in the hospital on psych ward they actually ended up ripping me off benzos because they could see like I would take a dose and my my body would just go crazy and so I come off everything but the propranolol this GP that I like cold like cold turkey pretty much or like yeah. I had started to taper the Ativan slowly when it was kind of doing that paradoxical thing. But as I was coming down, the movements and everything was getting so intense that that was when I ended up in the hospital. And then they pulled me off because I was at 0.6 of Ativan and I had been on one milligram. So I'd made it down to almost half. And then they pulled me off that dose. So the GP is like, I don't think you should take any more psych drugs. And so he bumped up my propranolol quite a bit. And that actually worked well for me. But being a diabetic, they, he didn't want to have me on it really long term, because I guess it can mask some, some symptoms of low blood sugar. So I took it for about four months at a fairly high dose. And it calmed things down physically for me enough to come off it. But the mental was still so bad and the hallucinating and it was it was terrible, terrible. And so I, I came off the propranolol, And I've been off all of that for just over two years. And so after being off everything for about six months, I got pregnant. Sex was actually one of my only escapes. And so I wasn't supposed to even be able to get pregnant with my long-term health issues, with my diabetes, and I had out-of-whack hormones, and I was almost 40. And it happened against all odds. And all of my symptoms ramped up again. Oh, okay. Yeah, tell tell me about that. Like a... how far, like at what, 
stage of the pregnancy did you start uh, experiencing like the, the the symptoms again? Yeah. So at, when I got pregnant, I had been drug free for seven months and I was still pretty much bad all the time, but I was starting to get just tiny breaks in symptoms for an hour here and there. And then I get pregnant. And actually, before I even knew I was pregnant, I was, I remember driving with my mom and I had to, we had to pull over so I could just walk and walk and walk. And I'm just like rocking and, you know, calling my support because I had met a few others in my kind of situation. So I called them for support and I just said, I don't know what's happening to me, but the movements are back, the pacing, um, the rocking, you know, the mental stuff. I just could barely function. And so I started getting symptoms of pregnancy a couple of weeks after that. And then I, it got confirmed and yeah, things were really, really intense in the first trimester. I think just the, the change in hormones. Um, and then the second trimester, things were a little bit better. And then the third trimester, I developed um, preeclampsia and severe complications of pregnancy. So I ended up needing an emergency C-section at 34 weeks. And at this point, I had an akathisia card. So I was able to show my surgical team and all of these doctors who weren't my regular doctors who ended up delivering my baby because it was high risk. Um, and they were really receptive to that and understanding and didn't give me any of that. Cause I was very worried about getting like metoclopramide or any type of akathisia inducing drugs. Cause I was starting to improve. Um, right. at that point. What, what, what is an akathisia card? What does that look like? Yeah. So I had been, I don't even know how I found it, but the akathisia Alliance. So they have these cards you can get for $5 and they have your name on it. And they're actually really informative. They're like a closed card. So on the front, it has the Akathisia Alliance and your name. And then on the inside, it explains what it is in really good terms. Like I like the wording they have on there and you know why this patient can't take such and such drugs, dopamine, agonists, or whatever they're called. And then on the back side, it gives a list of all of the kind of worst offenders and saying this patient cannot under any circumstance, take these drugs. So I, I took my card everywhere when I was pregnant because I was seeing high risk doctors and not my regular team just because of my situation and my age. That's really cool. Okay, great. Um, and so um, how did your symptoms uh, change during the, uh, after the C-section and the delivery of your child? What, what was that postpartum period like? Actually, initially, I felt uh, better. Like I started to feel, well, I was, I was so relieved that the pregnancy was over. <laughs> it was really difficult for me. And then it was tough afterwards, or sorry, it had improved shortly. I think just, I don't know if it was from, I felt like pumping breast milk gave me a little bit of a euphoric feeling almost, and it kind of calmed the symptoms down. And, it, but then at three months, I crashed completely and my symptoms were wild again like at the three month period postpartum everything came back again and so it was very I had to have full-time help with my because I was a single mom and I needed help to take care of my baby because I had mm -hmm. postpartum nerve damage from my swelling my preeclampsia I had out of control blood pressure and then all of these withdrawal symptoms so I had full-time help for about three months and it did crash it did kind of reach a peak at three months postpartum and wow. then I slowly, and then about six months postpartum, something just kind of changed and I started to really see improvement. So I was 20 months off drugs when I started to, I say, turn a corner where I really started to have periods where I felt normal for the first time in over four years. So, yeah. Wow. And then it's, I still really get the up and down. It's really nonlinear for me. Actually, I don't feel well right now. I'm having quite a few symptoms the last few days. But then I'll go a whole week or sometimes a month where I feel ninety five percent better. That's incredible. So, so, um, just just so, w when was your child born? What what was the date? May eighth, twenty twenty two. So Mother's Day, <laughs> she was born. Okay. Okay, and okay, so we're we're about a year after that now, um, and. When you say you turned a corner, what, what did you notice um, in terms of like the symptoms changing? It was really weird. I started getting brain sensations that felt different because a lot of times I feel like I have a burning brain or a sloshy brain or a tingling brain, but in a negative way, like a nerve, a nerve electric 
pain that I often get when I'm feeling bad, but this started to feel like my brain was turning on. It's hard to describe. I had um, almost like different parts of my brain were sort of buzzing or, but it was like a good kind of feeling. It was a, a pleasant sensation and I would feel it in different areas of my head. And then I remember mm-hmm. telling people something feels like it's shifting for me. And then all of a sudden my head was clear. And it was incredible because I had just been having these horrible mental symptoms for years at this point. And then it would, I started to feel way better. So around Christmas is when I really like kind of November, December, I was really starting to feel much better. But then if I would do something too strenuous, if I would have caffeine or if I would do something that would sort of rev up my nervous system, like have extra stress or something like that, I would start to feel the symptoms coming back and then I would crash for a few days, but then I would have a week where I'd feel great. And that had not happened up until that point. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, you know, when you think about what the benzodiazepines do, like GABA is the the break in your brain, you know, it, 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 it counteracts the excitation. And when you essentially outsource that to a benzodiazepine medication, um, your brain forgets how to work its brakes and because it's just relying on a chemical. Right. And so, you know, when, when you're in that withdrawal period, I mean, the, a lot of the times I feel like the symptoms are due just to this unchecked excitation of the brain, which is creating all of these disabling symptoms. And then just like you reported, I have several patients who, you know, they'll, spend a day working out in the yard and they'll love it while they're there. And then all of a sudden they'll push it too far. And then they're just ruined for several days because yeah. they, they don't have the breaks, you know, they, they've got themselves really revved up and they didn't have that capacity to, to contain it. And then it tips over into a place where it leads to that extreme fatigue and lethargy afterwards. And it's like this kind of flare up. And so I guess that's kind of what your brain is sort of continuing continuing to do now. It's rebuilding the natural bre- breaking system to keep things in that range, you know, neurotransmission in that range where it's really functional. Um, right. But you're still seeing that, you know, if I drink caffeine, if I do something like that, it kind of pushes it outside and, and then you get those symptoms again. And I can, I can tell when it's going to start because the first thing that will happen is my ears will start ringing. And when I'm feeling better, my head is quiet. I don't hear that tinnitus. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say too that the the long years that I was on antidepressants, I developed a pretty bad drinking problem. And I don't know if the antidepressants cause the alcohol cravings. I've read that they can. I don't know if that's true or not, but I drank to excess. Um, And so then I've stopped drinking as well. I stopped cold turkey. Right around the time I stopped benzos. And so it's really, I feel like the GABA has really just crashed in my, you know, because then I had also the the alcohol, you know, suppressing everything as well. Yeah, that that's definitely a um that's definitely a thing. I I, I know David Healy has um done legal reports for people who have um ended up uh you know uh maybe losing their job and things like that because of alcoholism brought upon by um and you know antidepressants so that's you're definitely not alone in um in experiencing that and and may i ask when you were on the antidepressants what was driving the alcoholism because i know you know some like was it like you'd feel irritable and uncomfortable and you'd want to drink or was it coming from i don't know some kind of disinhibition or like what was the like craving like how did how did it feel when you were in it um, I just, I, I loved the feeling that it gave me. And I think it was because it was a mix of medication and alcohol. And I just, I had a stressful job at the time that I loved, but it just, it completely took away any stress that I had it in it. It gave me no inhibition, which I had always been a very shy, reserved person. And then I just had this intense craving. Like I just felt like I needed it. And I don't feel that way at all anymore now that I don't take the drugs, but it was just, I loved the feeling. I felt euphoric and I had absolutely no inhibitions and no feelings of stress, anxiety. Like I just craved that feeling. Yeah. So it was almost like it intensified the feeling of alcohol, the euphoria there that made it really super addictive. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
because I, I actually drank a little bit after I stopped the pills. Well, I drank because I didn't, like, not as bad, but I didn't know that I sh maybe shouldn't be doing that. And it just didn't give me the same sensation once I was off the pills. So it wasn't as appealing to me anymore. That's really interesting. I'm going to start asking people about that. I think yeah. um, that because that, that's also, you know, that's a, u a unique clinical sign. It's like, does just drinking feel better on this medication because there's not a lot of medications where, um, you know, it accentuates the pleasant effects of the drug. Um, another thing that you might find interesting is a lot of the, in a lot of the PSSD interviews, one of the most use, interesting signs is that people, people stop responding to alcohol. They feel nothing when they drink it. There's no euphoria. The only, they just end up becoming kind of, disorganized um and just you know um intoxicated in a way that there's no euphoria so there does appear to be something you know with the serotonin sy system that either augments the the euphoric effect of alcohol or in some people has the ability to completely demolish it to the, to, to the point where it, they feel nothing Interesting. And I know it's yeah. common too. I started smoking. Um, so I would have the, the mix of the pills, the alcohol, and then the nicotine, and I would just get this intense euphoria and I just loved it. So, I mean, I felt good all the time in a lot of ways and that, but that was in my first long-term antidepressant use when I had no adverse effects or anything really at the time. So I was always chasing that. I was constantly in a state of euphoria or it was looking back, it was a false state, but it was really, I, I really enjoyed it. And that's what kept me chasing it. You know, I, and I think your response to the antidepressants is kind of interesting because um, it does have that effect in some people. I would say the more normal effect that I see is that they're somewhat mood constricting, you know, they're, they're anxiolytic, but your experience is different. You, I mean, this was a mood elevating drug. It yes. sounds like, I mean, is that how you would describe it um but the yeah. one thing i did notice and i didn't know this was a, an effect of antidepressants till after i quit them was i had the complete inability to cry i didn't feel depressed and i didn't feel sad but when something sad would happen that would normally bring about an emotion i felt nothing but i didn't feel like it was a bad thing it just it, it was kind of nice because i was like oh nothing bothers me so i That's, i really yeah. enjoyed it in a lot of ways yeah um and I mean, isn't that incredible as well? Because I mean, it, it sounds like you were on it for several years and it maintained, you know, what I guess was essentially this kind of therapeutic euphoria that, that, I mean, it obviously, you know, led you to make some bad decisions, you know, with the drinking and the smoking yes. and, and, and things like that. But it sounds like for the most part, you were able to function through it fairly in a fairly stable state. Well, if I would have known how hard it was to, to come off I would have never come off um yeah I don't think the last two or three years being on it were as quite as good as the first three or four I did start to notice that I was feeling more anxious more often again and more like depressive type symptoms and they seem to have kind of come out of nowhere I'd have panic attacks at night like I'd wake up in a panic and just stuff but it would very few and far between so I mean compared to now I was functioning a lot better on the drug but even before the drug was when I was optimal, because I think just physically and mentally, I was the best before I ever took anything. That's interesting. And and aside from the the craving for alcohol and cigarettes, what I mean, did you get in any other any other trouble due to disinhibition? Because I mean, it's easy to think about how a state of euphoria may may affect relationships, it may affect things that you say on social media, it may affect how you kind of present yourself at work. I mean, what, was it to the level where you ever saw it playing out in these other domains where you look back and just go, uh, I don't think Melissa would do that normally. I, I don't know if yeah. you could speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually managing a nonprofit at the time. And I remember being in one of like, it was um, care homes. And I remember being in mm -hmm. one of the homes once and I was drinking the cooking wine. Like I was drinking at work. Um, and yeah. then I was drinking and driving and it got to a point where the police were called because I had invited a stranger over um and i was completely out of, like i had mixed drugs cigarettes and 
and antidepressants and alcohol. And so it, 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 I completely blacked out the entire night and I woke up just in a sea of vomit. And I mean, I've been a diabetic since I was a child. And so I was putting myself in very dangerous situations, um, legally, you know, medically, in socially, in all kinds of ways. So definitely would never be something I would normally do. But I just wow. can't, I couldn't stop though. I just, I couldn't. And I ended up in AA. Um, yeah. But again, I had no idea that that could be a side effect of, of medication. I, I had no idea. And I, I don't have any of those desires anymore. That's so, crazy. That's, that, that's, 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 um, that, that's such, that's a, such an interesting story. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Well, it's such a double kind of a double edged sword because on the one hand I felt so great, but on the other hand, I was putting myself, it was getting more and more and more risky as time went on. I don't know if it you'd call it mania, but it was just intense thrill seeking. Like I was always chasing danger. Like it, it was just getting worse over time. Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, you're like a hypomania, like a very mild, a mild form of it. And, and and I mean that that's what that's what the drugs do. You know, they they yeah. they they're clearly you know labeled for causing manic manic type reactions. Um, and so it seems like for you, I mean, you were having one, but it was at a point where like you didn't become full blown like need to come into a psychiatric hospital. You were still mostly functional, although it was you totally know, functional in most ways. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. So I'm just yeah. curious, like, I'm, so I, I have a question for you. Um, I'm just curious, like, um, so you, you started your channel and is there a reason why you decided to kind of have these type of topics on your channel? I, I'm just curious what kind of led you to that. Like doing interviews with patients. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess it, 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 it brings these, topics to life in a way that you can't get on a chat group or a forum or something like that. I mean, you know, you could read things on a forum and be like, who is this person? What's their agenda? You know, are they just, you know, from some kind of fringe group? But like, I feel like when, when someone can see a person and hear their story and hear about their life, they could see themselves in them. So I wanted to make it, uh, you know, you know, not, not just these paragraphs on a page, but, Oh no, it's like a real person. Here's like Melissa who, who had a baby by a C-section while she was going through withdrawal, like just to kind of make it more personal. Um, I'm really thinking about these as, uh, you know, educational for other professionals at the moment. I assume they could be if someone is really interested in learning about, you know, what these problems look like and how they present and maybe like some of the nuance, like how to interview someone about intrusive thoughts and how the nature of the intrusive thoughts might give you a clue as to what's going on. It's it's the the interviews are really more for um, patients going through it, and then also the family members who may not believe the patients because I, I, you know, and you know, I mentioned that these things happen to people. They go online and, and then they go, oh crap, you know, this is what's happening to me, and then yeah. they go to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist says, you know, that's that's a that's a load of BS. No, you've got yeah. treatment resistant depression. The families are often confused, and they just go, well, I'm going to listen to the psychiatrist. I got to trust the authority here. But the hope is that um, people could, again, now give this to their family and just say, actually, like, here's another psychiatrist who sees a lot of these things. And, you know, check out these interviews with people who are describing a lot of the similar things to me. And then, yeah, because because some like I've, I've spoken to several people and it's it's essentially like destroyed their families. You know, it's created like you know, the, the, the misdiagnosis creates like a rift, the patient, the family starts saying, you don't want to get better. You know, you're not just yes. the, the psychiatrist told you to just get back on your medication and you're resisting. And then they end up throwing them in hospitals against their will because they're so sick and they're so distressed and it, it completely destroys the family. So yeah, I would say, yeah, that's like the main reason is just mm -hmm. the hope that um, other, other patients and family members could see this and it helps them be like, uh, actually like, I'm not crazy. And, you know, my spouse or my kid is not crazy. It's like a legitimate thing. Right. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the motivation. It's pretty, it's pretty refreshing. And actually it took me yeah. a long time to find my doctor who 
was similar where he said, you know, I've seen this before and it, it validated and he, he gave me a diagnosis of akathisia and generalized movement disorder. And he put me on disability because I was unable to work for so long. And I had went through every psychiatrist in my area and was either laughed at or, you know, same thing. You just have severe OCD and you need treatment. But every treatment was bringing on more and more symptoms. And but it was it was it's a very isolating experience in that way. Yeah, I mean, most psychiatrists are, um, you know, like like, like med medicine in many ways has become a production line, you know, you know, th this person has OCD, now they need this treatment. And, you know, you don't really need to kind of know too much else about them and just kind right. of, I'm going to process them. It's like, you know, process them in, in these 15 minute blocks. But as soon as you throw a curveball and they're like, oh, hey, you know, this person's having like a complicated drug reaction a withdrawal type thing and they and and there's no you know uh, manualized treatment strategy that's that's easy they're just like i don't want to hear it this is like complicating right. you know i don't want to get sued just just right. do just do what's on the on the manual please so you know yeah so well that's yeah, what I'm, i found because i had went to a, a, um, a walk-in doctor for the i don't know 10th time with my movements and i happened to see a doctor who doesn't normally work in that clinic and he i was the last patient of the day and he sat down with me for an hour and i've never i mean a, before then it was 10 minutes here and there with you know and just pills i think i had every every antidepressant and benzo prescribed to me and so to have someone sit down and listen and witness he witnessed all of the the movements and when it was really at its worst. And so to be able to get that validation, I know a lot of patients are unable to get that. And so they're seeking, you know, you know, you get your isolation from your family and then from the medical community and you are just in the most severe state that you've ever been in. And then you're completely alone. So it's yeah. a pretty frightening experience. Coming back to how, what, what are your residual symptoms now? And what would you say? If I'm not in a way, I, I don't know if you talk windows and waves on your channel. Yeah. 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 So if I'm, if I'm in a window, I really don't have any residual symptoms. I really don't feel much of anything. I will get the odd blip of, oh, I'll have a thought and I'll be like, Hey, where did that come from? Or I'll have, I'll feel a little bit of anxiety in the morning, but it's like not much, but in a wave, I'll still have the burning brain, the burning body, the intrusive thoughts, the hallucinations, the, um, you know, feeling of electricity pulsating, the restlessness, all of it will come back. But it's it's much more reversed now where I'll feel better for longer periods of time. And the periods where I feel really bad are shorter. So it's the reverse of how it used to be. But it's the same type of symptoms, but they just are fewer and further between where I have the episodes, if that makes sense. What, what kind of hallucinations do you have? So I'll have, I used to, it's, it's hard to talk about because what my psychiatrist called them was somatic, which I had never heard of before. So I'll have intrusive thoughts about self-harm um, and I'll <laughs> have physical sensations of pain, of being cut, of being stabbed. Like I, I can feel every sensation that you would feel if it was really happening. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And that did I mean... not start until I took benzos and came off. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, a, I haven't, heard, I've heard a lot, but I haven't heard that one before, like actually feeling like a knife is entering your body, you know, feel, because it's like in your, in, it's in your mind and then you feel it in your body. That's exactly what it's like. And, and it's, it's hard to even be able to tell um, when I even had even tried to discuss that with a doctor, that's not my current doctor. Um, I was threatened to be picked up by the police. I mean, there was no compassion at all for my story. And the fact that I'd never experienced this before, it was just, if you don't, you know, we are coming to pick you up and we are, we have a bed for you. You are staying in long-term. And so I had to lie yeah. my way out of that. That's what people learn a lot of the time because they go, I've been down that road before. I know that's not much help. Um, and right. so, you know, they could be terribly suicidal and they just go, no, thank you. I think I'll, I'll I'll take my chances on my own. Yeah. yeah. And I had those intense sensations and thoughts for over a year. I mean, all day. Yeah. So it was, it was terrible. It was, it was very intense, very, very intense. And it still can be at times. Did you ever feel like you were going to act on them or did you know that they were just alien thoughts from like a broken brain? Never. I never, ever had urges or 
yeah like thought that they were gonna no it just was something i couldn't shut off yeah mm -hmm. so it's been a long well, journey for me but things have definitely gotten better it's hard to raise yeah. a child like this but it's oh my god t tell me about that. that that's like i i completely forgot about that how is this how is what you've gone through influenced like the last i mean the first year of your child's life which is obviously like really demanding what, what's that been like juggling i've needed the a lot things? of help um is this family is this paid help how did you kind of family. get it together okay yeah, yeah very lucky but then um once i started improving at that six month mark uh when my daughter was six months old it became much easier i still had the help but i was <laughs> able to but i've i've developed intense fear for her so she's only allowed to ever see my doctor like i won't allow her to see any other because i have an intense fear of any pharmaceuticals because it happened to me so out of the blue and out of con my control and without any consent and so i have an intense fear of any of it happening to her or that i may have passed on like can you pass on neurological acquired neurological symptoms in utero like that's something that i fear as well uh, I don't think so. No, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, what 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 were you on during the pregnancy again? As far as meds? Yeah. So I took, um, at the end, I was just taking uh, levetalol. I was taking for my blood pressure and um, uh, I can't remember, Adalat. So I was taking those just for blood pressure. And then when I had my baby, I was given antibiotics. So I took Ansef. Um, yeah. and then I was, I was given blood thinners after, cause I had, I hemorrhaged and I had a, I had a blood transfusion and actually the only med that I had a really bad reaction to in the hospital was Benadryl. Um, sure. I had a pretty intense reaction to that. I don't know. I, I was given all kinds of drugs. I don't even remember. Yeah. I, well, I know that the, the benzos are the main ones that can be pretty teratogenic. Um, if you take high doses for a long time. So I think, I think you'll be okay. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if there's to me, at least I don't know of any way that you know if you have some kind of neurological injury whether that can get passed down i i i i can't see any mechanism so i would i would yeah i, would, I wouldn't worry about that one too much yeah. i have one more question for you if i have time sure yeah so yeah of course I, over my years in this i i have i have a hard time believing or calling it withdrawal because to me when you're in a withdrawal state taking the drug again, whether it's, you know, methamphetamines or alcohol or whatever, immediately stops the symptoms. And in so many people's cases, like in mine, taking the drug again after two years off made actually gave me a drastic reaction. And so I wonder if it's, if it's, is it some type of damage? Is it injury? Is it withdrawal? I have a hard time labeling it because it, I can't get my head around any of it, you know, and the spontaneous recoveries. And it's just such a very weird thing. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, withdrawal is a terrible word for it because just <laughs> yeah. like you say, it, it, it provides the expectation one that, Oh, if I just reinstate the previous dose, the withdrawal will end and I'll feel fine. And also what most people think of with withdrawal is this very linear downwards recovery. And really what it is, it's, it's a brain injury. It's, it's neurological dysfunction. You know, the system is bruised and sensitive and unpredictable and um the way it recovers is up and down you know with waves and windows and it's unpredictable you know reinstating the medication sometimes doesn't do anything sometimes it makes it worse um there's no yeah it's it's all over the place um mm -hmm. and so the i know that the benzo Diazepine Alliance for Best Practices are publishing manuscripts calling it BIND, so benzodiazepine-induced right. neurological dysfunction, which is a much more appropriate term um, for interacting yes. with healthcare professionals and things like that. Because if you go to an emergency room and you say, oh, I have a drug-induced neurological dysfunction, though, at, at least that way of describing it is like, doesn't it doesn't come so loaded with all these expectations of how it's going to respond and its clinical course like withdrawal has so yeah right. for problems like yours i would i often advise people don't don't call it withdrawal it's just yeah. it's just a shame that the fda has labeled it protracted withdrawal and the drug yes. labeling and things and, and i don't know for a long time like people have been calling it that in the literature but it's the wrong term
yeah yeah okay that's yeah. that's good because it doesn't it never made sense to me really either because it, it doesn't follow uh, that regular course yeah yeah okay Great. yeah well i want to say thank you thank you so much for for chatting with me um it's really nice to have a recovery story on here and um please please keep in touch yeah thank you so much i appreciate yeah. your time <laughs> yeah no worries Thanks. see All you right, take care. bye, bye. you too